I'm going to start at the top because I noticed in addition to the audio blackout that you've just had for the last couple of minutes, I also see some new people have joined. So I'm going to start at the top and begin with a very warm welcome to everyone who has joined us today. My name is Tanya Strevens. I work with the CSI team based in Geneva. I'm here to welcome you and to kick off the webinar. And in a few moments, I'll introduce you to my colleagues who will walk you through the revised ESIA guidelines that we're presenting today. The second important detail to share with you today is that we're not able to share the guidelines uh, with you as we had originally hoped. We have encountered some delays in the, design, in the design stages and need a couple more weeks to produce a final document. However, we felt today's webinar would firstly be a useful opportunity to introduce you all to the guidelines that will be available very soon, and secondly, would give you a sense of the content and the structure of these new guidelines. We think you'll find this a helpful and informative preview ahead of the release of the guidelines in the coming weeks. I also wanted to let you know that um, I've put you all on mute, except for myself, to reduce the inter interference on the line, but there will be time for questions and comments at the end. If, in the meantime, you have a point to make, please send me your message using the chat function on your screen. If you wish to minimize the control panel you see on your screen, you can do that. Um, using the two little arrows pointing together at the top of the right control panel. You just need to click on that icon. And please note that this webinar is being recorded. So I'd like to begin with an overview of today's uh, webinar content. We'll start with a reminder of why the decision was taken to revise the 2005 ESIA guidelines produced by the CSI and we'll outline the consultation process that was followed. Of course, you will want to see the content and structure of the new guidelines, so that will follow next. Because we don't have time to examine all aspects of the document, we will then highlight the key messages and the main features of the new guidelines. But because we know you will all be curious for some juicy details, we will then take the time to briefly step through the document section. There will be time for some discussions at the end when you can make any comments and ask any questions you may have. So who will you be hearing from? You'll hear from Portugal, from Spain, from Greece, and from Switzerland. Alexandra, Anna, and Costas have been active members of the CSI Task Force on Biodiversity and Land Stewardship for several years. Alexandra is the Principal Industrial Development Technician with Cecil, a Portuguese company, and is based in Lisbon. Anna is a Sustainability Specialist with Votorantim, a Brazilian company. Anna is based in Spain. And Costas is former Chair of the Task Force on Biodiversity and Land Stewardship, and is a Quarry and Raw Materials Technology Manager with Titan, based in Athens. And the final photo, this is me. I have a background in natural resource management and have been with the CSI for four years, working on diverse sustainability topics with member companies. So we're keen for you all to know that ESIA is not a new subject in the CSI. Eleven years ago, the CSI published guidelines on ESIA. However, a lot changes in that time. More specifically, there have been advances in ESIA understanding within and outside of the cement sector. For example, the methods for undertaking baseline assessments are better known. There is wider knowledge and acceptance of the mitigation hierarchy as a basis for decision. The principles of stakeholder engagement are embedded in many company policies now, and the value and importance of this engagement is widely accepted. Certain topics are not only better understood, but are also more in focus for the sector now, such as management of emissions and karst biodiversity. Also, thanks to customer demands, stakeholder pressure, tighter regulations, and reporting requirements, there's a strong trend towards greater accountability and transparency on the part of the companies. In the past, ESIA has tended to focus on the E for environmental, with 
insufficient emphasis and detail on the S for social aspects of impact assessment. There is a strong feeling that the guidelines needed to be easier to use and more readable, part of which was the need to have a document structure that reflected the ESIA process itself, which would enable readers to follow the guidelines in a logical flow. So we knew that a review was required, but needed to plan a consultation process that would ensure we captured the best advice on how we could make the revised guidelines more useful. So we embarked on a consultation process. We began with an online survey to understand the extent of the review that was required. We sought a consultant through a competitive tendering process. We hosted a roundtable meeting facilitated by the winning consultant to which we invited a range of experts and stakeholders who I'll mention more in a moment. We captured and shared both written and verbal feedback from all of the workshop participants. Based on this feedback, drafts of the guidelines were developed which were reviewed and commented on by members of the task force on biodiversity, many of whom are end users of the guidelines. And as is always the case in CSI, tools and resources developed at task force level must be verified and approved by company representatives who have the job of some delegates. These people are often, but not always, head of sustainability in the company and usually have fairly frequent access to the company CEOs. We're very grateful indeed for the wealth of expertise and knowledge that we benefited from, thanks to participation from a range of stakeholders. The feedback received through the workshop, through email, and even over the phone has helped to raise the quality and overall standard of this publication. We would like to say a big thanks in particular to Mariana Borges of the IUCN, Dan Ward, a consultant to WWF, Charlie Butt and Martin Hollands of BirdLife International, Tony Whitten of Flora and Fauna International, James Lee Cox of EBRD, Sandrine Devos of UEPG, and Florence Landsberg of the WRI, plus others who responded to the survey but who did not come to the round table. The feedback we received from stakeholders ran over multiple pages, so we can't go into the details now, but I wanted to share some of the headline messages that were captured during the consultation process. The guidelines needed to be less generic and more cement focused. There needed to be more detail and clear guidance on baseline biodiversity assessment. The guidelines should not be a prescription to comply with minimum requirements, but instead should set the bar higher and should be more ambitious. Rather than just text, the document needed to feature practical tools such as flowcharts, decision trees, and checklists. Attention should be given to major current sustainability issues in the sector, showing awareness of related broader sustainability issues. There should be sufficient flexibility in the guidelines for them to be relevant to small and large projects alike. The mitigation hierarchy should be explained and emphasized as the basis for decision making on any new development. The screening and scoping phases of the ESIA process are key elements and should be explained more clearly. The aspect of the guidelines addressing social impacts should be fully addressed and not overshadowed by the environmental aspects. Overall, the guidelines should be more appealing, readable, and user-friendly, with, for example, use of hyperlinks, a glossary, diagrams, footnotes, legends, color, images, and references. And finally, it would be helpful to support sections of the guidelines with real examples from companies, in other words, case studies. So we're satisfied that we've incorporated this feedback as far as possible. And now to take you through the sections of the guidelines in more detail, I'm going to pass you to my colleague from Titan, Kostis Dragosakis. Thanks, Tanya. Good afternoon or good morning to a few of them who may join from the other side of the Atlantic. And thank you for participating uh, in this uh, webinar. So I will start uh, with a short introduction and uh, overview of, uh, of the document, uh, outlining the context and the importance of the ESIA uh, to a project implementation. 
Well, um, although the ESIA process is a legal requirement in uh, most, if not all, countries, uh, the managers in a company or organization need to understand that uh, if the ESIA is not accepted by the local planning authorities and, uh, of course, other uh, local stakeholders, then the permission for the project uh, will not be granted. Uh, this should be seen as a process that starts at the conceptual design stage of a project and continues throughout all phases, meaning the construction, the operation, and the decommissioning of a project. For all these stages uh, of a project, both positive and negative environmental as well as uh, social impacts uh, should be addressed. The ESIA process is finally a vehicle through uh, which the engagement and ultimately the agreement of all stakeholders is achieved. Uh, these guidelines uh, we have prepared provide a practical guide for uh, IA for all projects, small to large in both scale and scope, referring mainly to new investments but also uh, to expansion or upgrades of existing operations. This effort uh, that we have made in CSI for uh, more than two years now uh, accumulates the, um, uh, the CSI members' ex expertise in the ESIA process, uh, collecting the experience from a variety of projects in different countries around the world, and going beyond the regulatory compliance to meet also international standards like the IFC performance standards or the EBRD performance requirements. We believe that uh, these guidelines demonstrate the approach and steps for the development of a successful ESIA, including the, the core principles that underlie this process, which are the establishment of a robust understanding of uh, the existing environment and social conditions, and the identification of the potential impacts upon environment and local communities, again, both positive and negative, and ensuring that the project is at all stages carried out in such a way to minimize and mitigate the adverse impacts and maximize potential, potential benefits. The guidelines propose a stepwise approach in setting out key decision points and describe the principles and objectives for the stakeholders' engagement. Finally, and uh, as mentioned by Tanya earlier, uh, this document reflects the, the latest um, developments in the cement industry and also changes in the expectations from the side of stakeholders. And uh, in this direction, we had also the very useful input and expertise of our expert consultants uh, who helped us in identifying all relevant aspects and uh, we appreciate their help and, and thank them for that. Um, both environmental and social issues uh, are equally addressed in, in the document and uh, the material sustainability issues for the cement industry uh, are taken into account and linked also uh, with uh, respective CSI documents that we have developed over the past years, um, including the CO2 and other emissions, health and safety, water, land use, for rehabilitation and biodiversity, alternative fuels, etc. The document is structured in uh, seven chapters. The first three are in introductory, whereas chapter four uh, consists the heart of the document uh, detailing the, the whole uh, ESIA process. There is one separate chapter for highlighting the importance of the stakeholder engagement in this process and also one chapter for the final outcome of the process that should be an environmental and social management plan. The document is, of course, enriched with real case studies from, from the cement industry. So, let's start now uh, getting a little bit deeper uh, in, this, in this process of uh, ESIA. Um, as mentioned before, uh, the guidelines set out uh, a stepwise approach for, a, for an ESIA process, and uh, each step or phase has its own objectives, scope of work, the stakeholders that are usually engaged, 
and tends to a decision point in order to proceed to the, to the next phase. The flow chart that you see here, and you can find uh, also uh, in the document that will be released uh, soon, um, describes in brief each phase of the ESIA process, uh, for which we will discuss in more detail next in this webinar. Uh, please note that the time frames outlined here are indicative of a typical uh, ESIA that is carried out in uh, uh, accordance to international standards. Of course, an ESIA schedule uh, could be longer or shorter uh, depending on the local conditions. So, in brief, uh, about what we see here, um, the process starts with a screening phase where it should be decided whether or not an ESIA uh, will be required. Next follows the scoping phase to determine and agree on the baseline investigations uh, and consider also alternative designs. The next phase, which is uh, the most time and resource consuming, uh, is the baseline assessment for understanding the existing environment and define those elements, those elements against uh, which the, uh, the impact will be assessed. The most critical stage uh, is the understanding and assessment of the impacts that should be addressed, minimized, and mitigated throughout the project development. And finally, the ESIA process ends with the development of an environmental and social management plan for each stage of the project. So, before continuing um, uh, with a more detailed presentation of uh, of the different phases, uh, we should point out that uh, a detailed and quantitative pr project description is required at the very early stage uh, before any ESIA process uh, initiates. The project description should include the objectives and scope of the project, of course the project location, the method statement for the site preparation and construction, the detailed project design and the operation and during the project, the required deployment, and finally, an overview of the proposed closure plan or decommissioning. So, now, starting with the screening phase, uh, its purpose is to determine whether an ESIA is required to be undertaken, and if so, what level of assessment is needed. In the guidelines, uh, there is a decision tree provided for this cause, and uh, here you can see just a more simplified form of that. Um, so, after having described, defined the project as a first step, uh, a series of aspects should be examined uh, legal-wise and also on the basis of local environmental conditions, uh, like for example if the project belongs to a mandatory list for which an ESIA is always required, or in the contrary is on an exclusion list, or if the project is in a particularly sensitive environment. So all of this uh, will help to decide uh, if an ESIA is required, which according to our experience is usually the case. The pre-screening in terms of uh, contact with the regulatory authorities can save time for all parties. It is recommended to involve the relevant stakeholders at the early stages in the planning process. And it should be also noted that in case of international funding for a project, this screening phase is used for the project categorization according to international standards. The screening phase is followed by the scoping phase. Uh, having decided that we need an ESIA, we need to identify the potential environmental and social impacts that are associated with the project. The level of the detail required as part of an impact assessment will uh, depend heavily upon the na nature and the scale of the project and also on the, sensitiv on, on the sensitivity of the environment. This relationship is reflected in this graph that you see here. Um, 
So we can see that a limited ESIA is likely to be required where a project of low impact potential takes place in a non-sensitive environment, for example. Or at the other end of the scale, a greenfield project occurring in highly sensitive environment will require a full ESIA and could also result in a project no-go um, early in this uh, scoping phase. So the purpose of scoping is to consider potential alternatives uh, for the project, to inform the stakeholders uh, of the project development from the early beginning, and evaluate any concerns that are expressed from them, to identify the potential impacts, and thus define the, the boundaries of an ESIA study, and finally provide information and help for the following stages of the process, uh, like for example the methods, mechanism and terms of references uh, for the specialist studies that will be required for the, for the impact assessment. So I will now hand over to Alexandra, who will navigate you through the core elements of the ESIA process meaning the, the baseline establishment and the, the impact assessment. Good afternoon to you all and thank you Costas for this brief presentation. So like Costas said, I will talk about the baseline and a resume of the methodology of the impact assessment. So let's start with the baseline. So, what is the purpose of a baseline study in the ESIA process? So, the primary objective of the ESIA process is to evaluate the potential changes that the proposed project may have upon the environment and society, and also how this can be avoided or mitigated. So, it's necessary to establish the state of the existing environment before the implementation of the project, and this is the purpose of the baseline study. It is important to note that the scope and detail of the baseline study should be proportional with the size and scale of your project. In general, the baseline study will be developed in three stages. First, we have the desktop stage, where we, the existing information should be collected. This is an office-based exercise. And then, the second stage is the field study, where it's necessary to collect additional data in the field to complement or verify the data collecting during the dosset stage. And finally, the reporting stage, where all the information that was collected should be presented in a baseline report. So, what aspects should be considered in the baseline study? The baseline investigation should consider all aspects of the environment that may be changed by the proposed project. This can be classified as physical, biological, and socioeconomic attributes. Regarding the physical studies, like surf water and sediments, groundwater, air quality, noise and vibration, landscape, soil, and land use, and so on, it's necessary to first identify the nature of the potential impact that may happen as a result of the proposed project, and also it's necessary to establish a baseline for each aspect. It is important to highlight that not all aspects are relevant for each site. You have to select the relevant aspects or attributes according to the proposed project. In the guidelines, several examples of the potential impacts and baseline data that should be collected of a new development cement facilities are provided in the document for each physical aspect that we mentioned here. So, regarding biodiversity, it's important that, to say that the effects and impacts on biodiversity should be investigated by an independent specialist with the appropriate experience and qualifications. The characterization of the biodiversity baseline for a particular site should involve two parts. First, the identification of the site biodiversity value, this is a desktop study, and the second, field service to confirm the biodiversity value. It's also important, and also, if possible, to identify opportunities for biodiversity enhancement that could result from the project. So,
So, what is biodiversity value? Biodiversity values represent components of biodiversity at different levels of biological organization, such as genes, species, or ecosystems. The baseline should cover all the three levels of biodiversity value and in different environments, like terrestrial, aquatic, marine, and so on. It is important to note that the CSI Biodiversity Management Plan guidance provides a practical resource for use at site level, offering step-by-step -step guidance in the evaluation and management of biodiversity. Regarding the socioeconomic studies, that is the third attribute that should be considered in a baseline study, we give examples in the guidelines of what social information should be compiled. Like, for example, a social economic description of the affected area, local and regional economic situation, if this an infrastructure, demographic information and health, security and safety are some examples of the social economic um, description that should be collected. Environmental resettlement and land acquisition should be compiled also. Cultural heritage, traffic and transport, and note that traffic is a potential and critical community safety concern. And in this study should be also include the importance of cost environments in cement production. This aspect in particular is particularly relevant to the cement industry. The project may also provide positive benefits profit, sorry, positive benefits for local communities, for example, job creation, enhancement of local economy. So it's important to collect and evaluate this information. So after the baseline assessment, all the findings of the baseline study should be presented in a baseline report. And this report should provide a summary of the information collected in the baseline study, each of the technical studies should be presented as a separate chapter in the baseline report. And also, the baseline report should summarize the field investigation that have been carried out. We advise the use of color method wherever it's possible to help the interpretation of the baseline report. And in many jurisdictions, there is a requirement to submit the baseline report to the relevant planning authorities for approval as an integral step in the ESIA process. We also recommend that interest stakeholders, including the general public, also be given the opportunity to comment on the baseline report. So having established the environment and social baseline, it is necessary to consider the potential impact as a result of the proposed project. The impact assessment should consider each phase of the development, including construction, operation and decommissioning. Also, the impact assessment should provide transparency and consistent assessment of the magnitude and significance of the potential impact on the environment. In the guidelines, we provide an illustration of a methodology that may be applied as an example to assess the impact or change upon the environment that, we'll re that I will resume in the next slide. So regarding the first step of the impact assessment approach that is measuring the potential change, first we have to assess the attributes of change that were considered in the baseline study. It is important to note there is no perspective approach set out in existing legislation how to measure the impact. However, it is important that the methodology should be transparent and consistent. As I said, in the guidelines, we provide an illustration of a methodology to assess the potential change. However, this is just an example to follow. Regarding the significance the significa of the impact, in the guidelines, we provide an example of a scoring system that may be adopted to measure the significance of the impact. We use, for example, magnitude, duration, scale, and probability to classify significance. So after measuring and assess the potential change and also the significance of the impact, it's necessary to define mitigation measure, measures that aim to reduce, neutralize, and repair the impact of the proposed project on people and on the environment. So when defining the mitigation measure, it's important to take into account the mitigation hierarchy because 
all mitigation measures should focus first on how to avoid social and environmental impacts. You can find in the CSI core rehabilitation guidelines and also in the CSI biodiversity management plan a lot of information about the mitigation hierarchy. So after the impact assessment, it's necessary to produce and present to the local authorities an ESIA report. And this report should provide a concise summary of the findings and recommendation of the technical studies that have been conducted in the impact assessment. In the document, in the guidelines, we define a minimum criteria for the information that should be included in a ESIA report. Next, I will pass to Ana Gonzalez that will approach the stakeholder engagement in our guidelines. Thank you very much, Alexandro. And good morning, everyone that is joining us today. We are passing. Tanya, can you? No, I think it's wrong. Okay, now it is. So we are passing into the two last section of the guideline. Four of them relate to the stakeholder engagement. When the intention of a company is to build a new plant or make a new project, besides the legal permit, it's necessary to obtain the social license to operate. To have success, it's important to implicate all stakeholders in a forum where the project is explained and different perspectives and issues from involved parts can be put over the table, commented, analyzed it, and finally integrated into the impact assessment process. This is what we call stakeholder engagement. A cement company must be open to consider the stakeholder concerns, relate the new project and its implication, and must be open and transparent. Why is it important to engage? As I said one minute before, to consider concerns of the local community, to raise issues from others' perspective around a new project, to present all the synergies between projects, cumulative negative impacts to be addressed by the company, and the advantage that may be achieved. Also, to avoid loss of resource and time, and to avoid long court battles, demonstration of protest at the gates, boycotts, environmental damage, and even facility closures due to a non-existent or reactive communication with stakeholders. At the end, the purpose of the stakeholder engagement is to obtain the acceptance or approval. So if they feel comfortable with the project and their concerns have been considered during all the process, we will obtain the social license to operate. An effective stakeholder engagement during impact assessment process creates a platform to build trust, increase the credibility of a company and stakeholder capacity. It forms the beginning of a positive long-term relationship between the cement plant, its neighbors, and other stakeholders. The stakeholders must be identified early. The dialogue with them must be open and frank to achieve engagement. It must be comprehensive, clear, and transparent, inclusive and exhaustive, and being active to proceed with greater benefit to everyone involved. The main objective is to ensure the process is considered free, prior, and informed, and ensuring that consultation exercise provides involved group opportunities to participate and offer consent. Once achieved the long-term relationship, the engagement can be exploited by creating, after project implementation, community liaison committees to provide an ongoing mechanism to discuss issues of interest and concern about the community and the company's activities. To provide enough information to enable stakeholders to become informed and educate about the proposed project and its potential impact, the participation must respect the following principles. The engagement must be inclusive. To give sufficient and consistent information with the necessary assist, presented in various ways that can be discussed in documents, meetings, workshops, printing, broadcast media, etc 
to ensure that all the concepts involved are understood. It should be allowed enough time for comments and at various stages in the process. Stakeholders must have many opportunities to exchange information and viewpoint. It should be supplying information that assists stakeholders to understand the role and responsibilities in the process. It should be clear for them when and how the feedback will be used within the, the impact assessment process. Now we are passing into the last chapter of the document, the environmental and social management and monitoring plan. To ensure a good management and implementation of the, of the impact assessment process, we can implement this, this kind of plan. What is this? It's the mechanism through which the finding of the impact assessment and the associated mitigation measures are implemented. It's, it's a living document and should be reviewed and updated on a periodic basis, depending on the nature of the impact occurring, changes in the receiving environment and or regulation, or change in internal organization requirements. And what should be included? The typical scope of a management plan may be distributed into several steps according to the project requirements. This is just an example which we want to show you what may typically include. That are the condition of approval that should make reference to the legal and the impact assessment requirement that project must comply with and reference to control guidelines and standards. The objective and target to achieve the mitigation measures to be implemented during the construction, operation, and the commissioning phases. Monitoring requirement that may include compliance and impact monitoring. It's also the responsibility of the company to conduct internal audit of the environmental performance of, of the operation. The auditing and monitoring result may be prepared in the form of an environmental and social performance report, which should describe the extent to which it has complied with its environmental requirement. To finalize, the environmental and social management plan, plan must ensure that conditions of approval are met and that resources allocated for environmental and social management are sufficient and consistent. It's a tool to verify environmental performance and ensure that impacts on communities are understood and managed. It responds to change in project implementation and to unforeseen events. I know that with a such little explanation, it's difficult to know what are the must have of an environmental and social management plan. But to facilitate your comprehension, the typical plans required for a cement plan and their associated query along with the key objective of each plan and parameter for monitoring the environmental and social performance are described in the guideline. So now it's again Tanya's turn to recap and explain you how to make comments and pose quest questions. Thanks, Donna. So I just want to very briefly recap on what we've just heard. Firstly and fundamentally, ESIA is a critically important topic in the cement sector because it's directly linked to, to obtaining license to operate. And this is a point that we've underlined several times in the new guidelines. We feel the review has resulted in a more user-friendly, up-to-date and therefore more useful guideline for cement companies. The guidelines have been developed to address the ESIA process in a sufficient level of detail to be of practical use to readers, with particular detail on the screening and scoping phases, on baseline assessment, on impact assessment, and on stakeholder engagement. We also wanted to underline that the ESIA guidelines are not a standalone reference. Throughout the document, you'll see reference to other related CSI resources, such as the Emissions Guidelines, Biodiversity Management Planning Guidelines, Quarry Rehabilitation Guidelines and others. So we've reached the end of the presentation part of today's webinar, but it's not over yet. A very important detail I'm sure you're all wondering is when exactly will the guidelines be available for download. We expect to have it ready in the coming weeks and certainly before the end of July. I will send it to all members of the CSI Biodiversity Task Force to all contributing stakeholders and to all members of the CSI's local impact focus area. 
If you're not in any of these groups and you would like to receive the document, please send me an email as I don't have email details for everyone on the webinar today. Now we'd like to invite you to pose any questions you might have. And to make this easy, please use the chat function um, available towards the, the right of your screen. We'll respond to as many questions as time allows. But just before we do that, I'd like to close with a word of thanks to everyone on the webinar today for your interest in this work and for joining us for today's presentation. I'd also like to thank all of the stakeholders once again, and also Anna, Alexandra, and Costis for speaking today and for their help in preparing this webinar, as well as Jessica Johnson, Head of Communications at STEM Bureau, whose knowledge of the sector has also helped to produce today's webinar. So that's it from me. Now, please let's have your comments and any questions you might have.